It was my birthday recently and one of the books I got was this fantastic recipe book called Persiana. It's got all kinds of amazing recipes from across the Middle East. You should totally buy it. One of the recipes that the author includes is a dip which she says she first had in some little cafe down a back street in the hidden alley somewhere. And she begged the chef, can you tell me what's in this dip? It's incredible. How did you make it? And the chef says no. He wants to keep the recipe all to himself. And so in order to be able to put the recipe in the book, what she had to do was to work backwards from the finished article, which was what she had. She had to work backwards and reverse engineer it to figure out how to build it in order to have this fantastic dip as the end result. That working backwards and figuring out what goes into it in order that you might get something that you really, really want is exactly how our third big stone works. Love. The thing about love is that no matter what context we think about it in, we're led to believe all the time that it's instant. Think about some Disney cartoon that you watched when you were young. Maybe you're still young and you're watching Disney cartoons and you see this prince or this princess meet and instantly they love each other, they know each other, they complete each other. And the birds sing in the air around them and some music with some strings starts playing in the background and incredibly they fall in love right in that moment and it's instant. Or think about a friendship group that maybe you've seen in the movies and they have each other's backs. They go on wild adventures together. They know each other intimately. They have this ability to understand when each other are joking and when each other isn't joking. And they understand all the foibles and the personality and the character of each other. And they're incredible friends who love one another. But it wasn't instant. We've got these friends and they've got this house and they would talk about their house like, we love our house. And it's a great house. I love their house. Their house is fantastic for their family life and it's got a, a, an open plan kitchen diner. But it, it didn't always look like that. Now they love their house. Now their house works perfectly. But when they got it, it didn't look at all like what it does now. It's been remodeled. They've put a new kitchen in. They've put a new doorway in. They've knocked a wall down here. They put the garage down and built an extension on it. They've completely changed the garden. And now it's something they love. But it wasn't always like that. Think about your favorite teddy or your favorite toy. When you started playing with it, it wasn't your favorite toy. It was just a toy that you liked. But because you interacted with it all the time, it became the teddy that's rough around the edges. It became the car that's got chipped paint. It became the bike that squeaks a little bit on the brakes because you've invested so much time in it. It wasn't instant. Look at me. You think it's bad now. You should have seen me when Laura first met me. She's changed loads of stuff since we first got together. My fashion sense is much better now. Can you believe that? I don't use comedy to hurt people nearly as much as I used to. I'm better with my language. I'm better with my skills. I'm better with my character. It's a working progress. But the thing that she saw when she first met me wasn't the finished article. To love something, you have to create it. To love something, you have to choose it before it is what it will become. There's this compelling description of the early church. The early church being the first Christian church who knew what it was to follow Jesus, who remembered what his voice actually sounded like because some of them had hung out with him and they'd followed him around and they'd learned from him and they'd eaten with him. And they start off this church and the compelling description of it is this, that they know each other and like each other and love each other. They do all the God stuff. They read the Bible, they pray, they worship. When they see a sunset, they're like, oh my goodness, that's incredible, God, good job. But also they're in and out of each other's homes. Also they share food and their stuff. Also they seem to, and they get a reputation for loving one another. That's the prototype for the community that we've always tried to build around St. Mark's. That's what we wanna be like. We want, don't we, a community where we know each other and love each other. 
fast forward in your mind to a place where you know other people, you know their birthdays and the important anniversaries in their life. You understand the highs and the lows that they've gone through. You can have a second guess at what they might be feeling because you know them well. You know whether they're an introvert or an extrovert. You know whether they're going to be exhausted by this party or whether they're going to be juiced up and want another party straight after the party because they're so excited about it. You know whether they're into sci-fi or sport. You know because you've been to some parties at their house. You know because you've sat and wept with them when something terrible has happened in their life. They're the people in your phone book that you go to to share a silly joke that you've just seen or to hook up with, to go and watch a movie or to go for a socially distanced walk or to just share some news with. It's joyful to your heart and to your soul when you see them and it feels natural to sit around a table with them. That's a Christian community of grace, of love. But to get that, you have to choose it before it is that. Because let's be honest, some of you have gone for a coffee with me or had a meal with me or gone for a socially distanced walk with me and it's not nearly as exciting as you thought it might be. In fact, sometimes I've offended you. Sometimes I've made jokes that have hurt. Sometimes I've just been downright boring and sometimes it's difficult to hang out with somebody the second time and the third time and to keep pursuing love when it doesn't feel the most natural thing to do when it would be far easier to divide off and split off because we think differently about politics or to divide off and split off because we prefer different music or we have a different type of personality, when it'd be far easier and more comfortable to sit at home and watch Netflix rather than jump in on Zoom, when it'd be far more preferable to me rather than having to go out in the rain and spend time with somebody to be at home and to do the things I like and which aren't gonna require investment and energy. It's easier in our culture to diverge rather than dive in. And let's be honest, being a community based around love is harder now than it's ever been. The volume of division and of hatred within our culture is huge and intense and draining and wearing. And it be seeps into us that it becomes the norm that if you don't like somebody or you disagree with them in the smallest way, then you're not friends anymore. That happens in the playground, it happens in politics, it happens in business, it happens in our friendship groups. Not only that, COVID happens and it makes it so hard to hang out with people. We're all Zoom fatigued and we've all had enough of interacting on functional screens where it becomes hard to have those inconsequential conversations about life that you would normally have if you sat around a table. It's so much harder than it's ever been. It feels so much easier to stay away because nobody will notice if you're not on the Zoom screen. Nobody will notice if you don't drop them a text. Nobody will feel the absence of your presence in that WhatsApp stream. It just feels harder to engage. I know that, I get that, but we miss you. When you're not around, we miss you. The body, the village, the team, the gang is weaker without you. It's not the same without you. Eugene Peterson writes about this brilliantly, as he does about so many things. He said, every day I put love on the line. There is nothing I'm less good at than love. I'm far better in competition than in love. I'm far better at responding to my instincts and ambitions to get ahead and to make my mark than I am at figuring out how to love another. I'm schooled and trained in acquisitive skills, in getting my own way. And yet I decide every day to set aside what I do best and attempt what I do very clumsily. Open myself to the frustrations and failures of loving. Daring to believe that failing in love is better than succeeding in pride. There's this guy called Paul who writes this brilliant letter that makes its way into the Bible. And he says this, that when everything else fades, everything else can fade, these three things, faith, hope, and love remain. That's why each year we bring ourselves back and recommit because it leaks from us, hey? I have to remind myself every day, not every year, that I wanna have faith in Jesus, be a hinter of hope, and work for hope for other people and to show love and mercy and grace to others. 
If we all dive in rather than diverge, if we all invest in relationship, if we all pursue, even when it would be easier to sit at home, then maybe we can keep on building St. Mark's to be even more each year than it is already a community of faith, hope, and love.